Good afternoon, Saints. Yeah, we're going to do a very short study before we begin the medical missionary. This is um, another part of the classes. Just do a short study. Um, before we begin, before we begin, let us, um, let us kneel for a word of prayer. Let's kneel. Loving Father, we come before you, Lord, this afternoon, thanking you so much for the blessings of the Sabbath. Thank you so much, Lord, for the truths we have heard, for the convictions you have brought. We are truly thankful, Father, that your word has power to transform the human heart. We want to thank you so much, Father, for what you are doing. We come before you, and Lord, we are pleading. We are pleading that as we open up your sacred word, that you would open up our hearts and minds, that your word might find a place within our hearts and bear fruit unto holiness and righteousness. Father, we want something more than merely a truth that is intellectual. We want it to reach our hearts and transform our lives. Please may you bless us as we look one more time at this great institution you have given the human family. Please bless us now and abide with us. Please may your spirit be present. And help us to see, Father, that indeed we are living on the brink of the eternal world. And that whatever we do, we have to do quickly. Abide with us now, Father, for we ask these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so we're going to do a very short study before we begin the medical missionary class. Um, in the book Education, page 250, Education 250, there's something that the prophet says are institutions, but they're institutions God has given humanity. And she says that these institutions are indissolubly linked together. When something's indissolubly linked together, can it be separated? You're trying an impossibility. You're trying an impossibility. Now there are two institutions she says God has given us. And these two institutions are indissolubly linked together. Does anybody know what are two institutions? <laughs> Sabbath and marriage. Sabbath, Sabbath and marriage. Sabbath and the family. So she says that these institutions, actually in Adventist home, child guidance, she says they are twin institutions. Twin. She calls the Sabbath and the family twin institutions. Now, do you know, biblically speaking, you will see it in the Bible, that whenever a man's probation was about to close, do you know whenever a man's probation was about to close, uppermost in God's mind was their family. It was their family. Their family. And I want us to see publicly, we're actually we're gonna be looking at partially at the family. We're gonna to touch partially on the family. But we want to look at this, why this institution? You know, I'm asking, Lord, please release me from this. <laughs> release me, let somebody else speak on the family. <laughs> but God keeps the family, the family, the family. And not only will this benefit those who are married, but I believe that one of Satan's most successful means of crippling a young man that God has called into ministry, a young woman that God has plans for, the best way to cripple that person is by uniting them with someone that God has not called him to unite with. Do you know that I, God, do you know I, oh friends, there's a high probability that this is what Satan does. God normally as an individual, now obviously, question, has God called everyone to marriage? I'm asking a question, I'm, that's a, I'm asking you. No. How do you know that? 100% true, but how do you know that God has not called everyone? Brother? Amen. Thank you. And Paul says that in, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, he makes it clear. He said he wished all men were like him, but then he says, well, no, no, no. <laughs> Continue. God has not called everyone to be like me. So obviously we see a holy man of old, Elijah, John the Baptist. You, you see that God never called all. But based on inspiration, that marriage is actually given based on inspiration for the glory of God and the uplifting of humanity. So God has given that institution. It's not a mistake that God gave marriage. Marriage was given for the glory of God. 
and for the uplifting of humanity. So marriage, rightfully so, was to bring individuals together and if rightfully conducted, would make a man more like Jesus, would make the wife more like Jesus. And if rightly conducted, it would have worked for the uplifting of humanity, if rightfully done. Out of every institution God gave, out of every institution, now I'm gonna set the Sabbath aside, but out of every institution that God has given, marriage family stands at the head of every institution. You can name the institution, family stands at the head. Somebody says, why is that? Do you know that not even the church stands at the head, it's the family. Church, gathering, it's institution of heaven. Heaven says we should gather. But do you know that church is not number one institution? In God's plan, it's not number one. That's not number one. Do you know how you know a man is successful? To be a leader within the church, you look at how he conducted his little, his little church. And based on inspiration, we're going to see what did heaven design every home should be. I'm going to show the Bible. The Lord was teaching me this morning. Every home based on the Bible was supposed to be a gate to heaven. Every home, every Adventist home was supposed, you know, what's a gate? When you end, what, what is the first thing you open up when you enter into somebody's house? If they have a yard, gate. That is the first thing you open up as a gate. And publicly speaking, an Adventist home is supposed to be the gate to heaven. But your home can't be a gate if it's not a heaven. You can't say my home is a gate to heaven, but your home is looking like a hell. Nothing like a heaven. How can it be a gate? And friends, there's only two options. It's either heaven or hell. You're either hot or cold. Now, there are some lukewarm homes. We don't want any lukewarm. God wants it fully hot. He don't even want it cold. He wants it fully hot. So we're going to look at this institution. We're going to look at, this will be our last time speaking on this institution, if God allows me to stop. We're going to look at these two institutions, family and the Sabbath. Now, One thing concerning this issue, I was reading a, what will you call it, a letter that the prophet wrote to sister, I think her last name was Craig. And the prophet was writing to sister Craig. And I was just astonished at what the prophet says to sister Craig. She says to the sister something interesting. Now, this sister was married to a brother whom God had called into service. And I want you to see what the prophet says. Now, this, um, young people, this especially take heed to the counsel we're about to read. Those who have not taken the step. I want you to see this. This is, this is, this is a letter written to Sister Craig, on behalf, writing to her concerning Brother Craig. And I want you to see this. Now, we're coming back. We're going to show you, friends, we are in a... Why are we speaking? Someone says, please leave this alone. Let's, let's get to the final crisis. We're going to show you a crisis is brewing. No, we're not guessing. And when we study on Monday, Islam, we're going to show you that 2020 was prophetic. It was highly prophetic. But many people looked at 2020 and all eyes were just fixed on 2020. And they failed to understand the movements the Pope was making. Now, as I said in our previous studies in the school, that the final crisis doesn't depend so much on the Pope. Do you know that the Pope only can make movements as Jesus makes movements in the century above? His movements, the Pope and his movements and Satan and his host, they cannot move only when Jesus says they can move. Why his church is in danger, should the crisis come before he has a perfected people, then he has no one to stand. So before the crisis can break, we, that's Bible. The Bible teaches that those who are persecuted, it says that Paul says that the godly, he says all that love godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So what first comes? Persecution, godliness or godliness persecution? Godliness comes first. So God can't allow persecution to come, the National Sunday Law, until God has a godly people. Now, is he waiting for the old church to be, to be revived? No. She says, if we are waiting for that day, that day shall never come. So based on inspiration, not the old church. 
it's going to be a little remnant. And that remnant is going to be so small that when the crisis breaks, it looks like no one's standing. It looks like there's not one. It looks like the entire building, the entire structure, the entire seven day Adventist movement is going down. But God is going to have a people who are going to stand true to him. A people that are going to be willing to sacrifice everything, be the price what it may. They're going to heed the counsel of the true witness and thus be fitted for translation. Now, what I am saying, friends, a crisis is brewing. We're going to show you a crisis is brewing. Now, I, I, I told you, I, I've been talking to you, I've been telling you that what year did we say that the powers that be are looking at a digital currency globally? 2023. 2023. I want you to see your country, South Africa, your very na the nation you're in. Now, look at the date. Look at the date. This is a couple of days back. It says Reserve Bank, South Africa referring to Reserve Bank, talks up digital rand for South Africa. What, what, what is South Africa talking about? Digital currency. We showed you New York, but South Africa is just behind them. South Africa says we also going digital. Revelation 13 verse 17 says, a time's coming where no man can buy or sell. Say, he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Friends, I, like, to me, I'm saying, Lord, this is crystal clear that this is it. Tell me a generation that saw this. Tell me a generation that saw the world moving digital. It never existed. Never existed. And we are told that those year to four that has proclaimed the third angel's message, warning about this crisis, she says they have often been regarded as mere alarmists. But as the crisis doubted, as, the, as people see it appearing, approaching, many are going to see that what Seventh-day Adventists have been teaching is not error, it's truth. And you know those books we have given out, great controversy. Many people, actually when she says the loud cry comes, many are going to trace their beginnings of conversion, great controversy. When they see the fulfillment of these events. So South Africa is going digital. Do you know what this here means? Do you know what this means? Someone says, I'm making it up. This means God almost has a perfected people. I'm going to show you the quotation now. I'm not making that up. I'm going to show you a quotation that tells you this. That God almost has a perfected people. Now all you need to do is examine your own heart. Lord, am I amongst those people? Am I amongst those people? It says, South African Reserve Bank, in collaboration with... You can see that sub, sub um, Saharan African central banks are mulling the potential use of central bank digital currency CBDC, CBDCs to improve payment systems in the region. So the very nation, South Africa, we told you it's coming. We told you it's coming. Now we can say to you, it's no more prophecy. It's now being fulfilled in your eyes. Remember when Jesus read the scriptures? He says, what he has just read, he says, now it's been fulfilled. Sure. Friends, we are on a verge of the crisis. We are on the verge of this final crisis. This, this, this is going to close, based on inspiration, this thing closes our probation. Do you understand within the next few years, next few months, we don't know exactly how long, but within the next few months, every one of us, our eternal destiny is going to be decided. We're going to know where we're going to spend eternity within the next few months to the next few years. This is it, friends. This is it. And my heart, I tremble. I tremble because of my own heart. We are on the borders of the heavenly Canaan. And what we know in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that all what happened to ancient Israel are written for our examples and are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. When Satan saw the children on the borders of that promised land, do you know that Satan never, he ne he never pulled back anything? He knew that should they get into the promised land, God's going to overthrow these nations. And his fame is going to be spread throughout 
and many are going to want to follow the true God. Let me stop these people. I wonder, we studied it. How did Satan get them on the borders, the cream of the crop? Over 20 something thousand fell. Passion, Passion. Passion woman. Obviously, you can also vice versa, men. For us now in the heavenly Canaan, on the borders. We're on the borders, friends. National Sunday law. We're almost there. We are almost there, sister. Now, I want you to see this quotation. I'm coming back to this. Remind me, come back. Tell me, come back. Come back there. Desire of Ages 121. Desire of Ages 121. Listen to what the prophet says. She says, in the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan. Now, she says, in the last great controversy with Satan. So, after the last controversy with Satan, is there anything else? This, this is, right, what she's introducing to me is the lost. After this, there's nothing. I want us to see, based on this quotation, how do we know we are reaching the lost conflict with Satan? How do we know that? She says, in the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. Now, based on what she says, What's going to happen in the last great controversy with Satan? What's going to happen in it, in it, when it comes? What's going to happen when we're in it? What does she say? Every earthly support is going to be what? It's going to be cut off. So question, if we are near in it, should we see signs of things being put, put into position that indicate to us that our earthly support is about to be cut off? But won't you agree with me? Now, what, what specifically is she referring to when she says that as we come to the final crisis, she says every earthly support is going to be cut off. Every earthly support. What, what, what is she referring to? Amen, brother. She's referring to the buying and selling. It says, because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers, they will be forbidden to buy or sell. Now please help me. What will be able to be put into position or put into operation that will forbid or control the buying and the selling? Digital currency. I'm going to make the international bank, the man, the CEO of the international bank speak and tell you that as long as people are still using paper money, he says we cannot track their buying and selling. I'm, 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 you'll hear the man himself. He says, and we, we, we play the video. He says clearly that the only way to track everybody's buying and selling, we must get everyone on a digital currency. Now, question. No buy, no sell. No buy, no sell. This is cutting early support offers no buy and no sell. Now, someone says, this is Satan's strategy. I say, amen, true. But I also see it as God's strategy. Do you know what the no buy, no sell for? You know what God is trying to do? He's trying to get us back to the original system of living. The Garden of Eden. As heaven... Richest economy, no buy, no sell. Streets of gold, no buy, no sell. Eden, one of the most beautiful, beautiful places that was ever on this earth. Economy, no buy, no sell. God is trying to rush us back into that Eden life. But I want you to see something else as well. This is a powerful quotation. Now, what is the purpose of the digital, digital system? What is its purpose? to control our buying and selling and to cut off earthly support. Watch this, watch this quotation. Now, by what year are they pushing for it? What year do they want it functioning? <laughs> Friends, watch this quotation, 2023. Is this a move, is this a move to stop our buying and selling? I'm saying if we don't go along with the agenda eventually, 
Watch this quotation. Watch this and marvel. 2023, the, the powers that be on say this date. This is not our date, it's their date. Watch this quotation. Cutting off our earthly support. Listen to this. She says, inspiration speaking, we can never perfect. What does never mean? Never. It's just not possible. Not possible. She says we can never perfect, not just a Christian character, we can never per perfect a round, full Christian experience until every earthly support is removed. 2023 means God has been all that he can to bring us to perfection. This is the year God's going to try his best to bring his church to perfection. Because that's the year when the powers that be are going to try to move us to a system where our earthly support can be cut off. We are on a verge, friends, of a stupendous crisis and God wants to bring us to perfection. We, but brother, thank you, brother. What must we do? This is a promise, but what do we, there's a part we have to play. We must step first. We must step first and do our part so God can do his part. Now, we're coming back to this. Croatia. What date is this? December 1st, 2022. There's an agitation. Tourism depart, dep the dependent Croatia moves to ban shopping on most Sundays. No buying, no selling on our Sundays. Are we seeing the gathering storm? There's a storm that is gathering. There's a storm that is gathering. Now, I want us to be, oh friends, there's so much, we're not gonna study much. We're gonna just do a short study and we'll pause and stop, pray. But I want us to see something interesting. I'm coming back to this. Coming back, coming back, coming back. I want us to see something interesting. We are talking about who? Sister Craig. I want you to see this quotation. Now this is for the young people. I want you to see this quotation concerning Sister Craig writing about Brother Craig. Now every young man that has come here, I believe you believe in some degree God has called you to ministry in some degree. There's no, and every, elderly as well. <laughs> everyone, everyone. God has called to ministry here. Yeah. Everyone that is here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we have to add him. We have to add him. God has called you to ministry. And one of Satan, I'm telling you, friends, I'm telling you, that if Satan wants to cripple a young man that God is calling, let's read the quotation. Let me pause and not speak. Andrew, let's read this quotation. This is a letter to Sister Craig. Now, how, how far are we to the eternal world? A few more years. We're we on the borders of the eternal world. I want you to see this quotation. That's why, friends, look, look at this quotation. It says, Sister Craig, I would not present this matter as I do. Were the war, they're not another life so closely bound up with yours, and were not that life one whom God has chosen to be his servant. So let's pause and think before I go any further. The one that Sister Craig was married, that God have a special calling on his life. It's quite clear from the quotation. The fact that we are here, God has a special calling on your life. Now I want you to see this, young men. Listen to what the prophet says. It says this marriage, talking about Sister Craig and Brother Craig, this marriage ought not to have been. So the prophet is writing under inspiration and says that your marriage with Brother Craig ought not to have been. Heaven did not want this marriage. And then I want you to see what she goes on to say. She says, but the step has been taken. And then watch the red words. And for your husband, the work of overcoming is now tenfold more severe than if he had never seen you. The prophet says that man's now journey to heaven becomes tenfold order. Friends, you know your heart is already tenfold order. It's a battle. It's a struggle already without anything else. You, you know your, this march is a struggle. 
But here's a marriage when not done under God's guidance and makes it almost impossible to gain heaven. In a book, Adventist Dome, she says it depends upon a man's wife, a minister. Actually, there's a chapter here on a minister's wife. Well, how should a minister's wife look? Now, there's some men already, you're married. <laughs> Prayerfully read it with your wife. <laughs> and say, wife, let's try and conform. <laughs> there's a chapter on a minister's wife. And in this chapter, she says that a minister, his success, a minister's success depends upon his wife. The, the, the prophet says his success depends upon the wife, whether he will grow from day to day or whether he'll be pulled down. Much depends. Much, much, much depends upon the right decision for those who are not yet. So question, if Satan sees that the final crisis is imminent, the National Sunday Law, which this thing is going to close our probation, that's Esther 8.8. 8. Once you get the seal, once you get the mark, your probation is now closed. This is the final test. But before God gives us the final test, what do you think God's going to do? What do you think Satan's going to do? He's going to try and interfere with this institution. Why? Education 250, that they are indissolubly linked together. Now, you follow with me the reasoning. If something's indissolubly linked together, question, is it possible if, if God, if the prophet is correct, which he is, if these two institutions, if they are, and I believe they are, if they are indissolubly linked, as the prophet says, question, can I fail on this one and pass on this one? Impossible. If I want to pass on this test, what is the test I have to first pass on? Family. Family. There's a chapter as well for people who are married and their partners are not in this faith. There's a chapter in the book Adventist Home. God has given us a blueprint. This is a blueprint. And if your home is going to... Now, friends, I want you to see something interesting. Before I come back to the young people, I want you to see something interesting. Come on me, question. Before I even go anywhere, I want to ask a question. We're not... We are talking. I want to ask a question. What do you call a place where a man stays? Where he dwells? What do you call it? Oh, oh you do agree with me? That a place where a man stays or where a woman stays, stays. They're not visiting. They stay there. What do you call a place where a person stays, they dwell there? You call it a home. I want you to see something interesting. God, I want you to see this. Come with me to Exodus 28. Let's go to Exodus 28. Friends, based on the book Adventist on page 15, home should be all that the world implies. A little heaven on earth. That's what home should be, a little heaven on earth. And Deuteronomy 11 says that God desires to give us a taste of heaven while still on this earth. That's what he desires. Actually, the prophet says in volume 7, we show you the quotation, she says that in order to go to heaven above, you first need to have a heaven below. If there's no heaven here, there's no way you can enter the heaven above. And if we have time, we don't want to spend too much time, we're going to show why some homes cannot be a heaven. Why some homes will remain a hell. Exodus chapter 25. Exodus 25. Exodus 25. Remember you told me that where a man dwells, that is his what? Home. Exodus 25, verse 8. It says, God speaking, and let them make me a sanctuary. Why? That I might dwell amongst them. So what did God tell him to make a sanctuary? So that what can happen? So that he can come and dwell amongst them. Now, I want you to follow. So the sanctuary was a place where God dwelt. His dwelling place. We said where a person dwelt is a what? They are home. I want you to see when God was actually, let me not say it because you'll get it. Come with me to Hebrews 8. I want you to see something interesting. When a home was to be built for God, I want you to see this. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews the 8th chapter. 
Now, Hebrews 8 is speaking about the sanctuary which we just read about. And then I want you to see what the Bible says concerning that sanctuary which was to be made for God to dwell in. I want you to see that when God gave or told Moses to do that, Moses was not merely to go and build it according to his own ideas. He was to build it according to the pattern shown him. Hebrews 8 verse 5. But speaking about the sanctuary, it says, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, that's the sanctuary, for see, saith he, that thou make all things, not according to your ways, but according to the pattern show thee in the mount. If God is going to dwell in a place, if God is going to dwell in a place, that place must be made according to the pattern that he has revealed to mankind. If you try and build anything without the pattern, God can never dwell there. I don't know if you are following friends. What made the sanctuary a place for God's dwelling? Because Moses made it according to the pattern shown him in the mount. I wonder if God has given us a pattern of how a home should be like. And I want to say, amen, sister, yes. And I want to say this, friends. Now, praise God for redemption. You know what's redemption? We can make mistakes and God redeems. You can make mistakes and say, oh, I fail on this, I fail on this. But thank God he has redeemed us as a family. There is not redemption, there's redemption. But and I'm saying blessed is that family that can be redeemed. And have an experience with heaven. Blessed are that family. Blessed is that man that has his wife next to him. Blessed is that man. Blessed is that woman that has her husband next to her. But blessed, you hear what I'm saying? Do you know there's, a, there's degrees of having, let me, let me, let's rewind that, let's rewind that. Let me say it like this, so that we can, we get this, this point. Do you know when we get to heaven, not every one of us are going to appreciate heaven on the same level. Mm. I'm going to show you. A the prophet says not every one of us, some appreciation of heaven will far exceed other people's appreciation of heaven. The blessings there, the joy, they'll enter more into the joy of the Lord than, some, than others. You say, why is that? We're going to read the quotation, why? Yeah. But we, we, we're going to show why. But we're not going to fully study this out now because when you study true education, we're going to look at that. But when I read that quotation, it struck me that indeed there's redemption where God can redeem people who have made mistakes. But blessed are those who from the very beginning make all things according to the pattern showed them. That means they don't take missteps from the very beginning. They look at the pattern and they say, I'm going to build everything according to the pattern shown me. Blessed are those people. And young people that are here, if you want God's blessing, everything must be made according to the pattern. She says, let every step towards the marriage alliance be characterized by modesty, simplicity, and an earnest desire to please and honor God. Every step. Now, before I show you that quotation, before I show you that quotation, I want us to see something. We're still on the young people before we, we, we shift gears. I want us to see this. This is from mind character. No, no. Where's my quotation? Where's my quotation? Mm. Mm. This is from mind character and personality. Is this the right quotation? Mind character and personality, page 302. Do you know, are we in school? Yes. We're in school. Do you know that based on the blueprint, the blueprint school. I'm saying based, based on the, now, God, has God given us a pattern for the families? Adventist home. Has he given us a pattern for true education? How to conduct and run our schools? Do you know that the prophet says that every school there should be a time, every student should be in bed. In our school, she specifically says there's a specific time. The prophet also tells us a rule that should govern every school. But obviously, the rule based on the blueprint 
was not always, how do I explain it? Let's read the quotation, then you can see it. So it was a rule, but God permitted that that rule at times can be, I won't say set aside, but let's read the quotation, you'd see it. You'd see it, you'd see it. This is for the young people. Mind, character, and personalities, page 302. It says the rules of this college, the rules of this college, strictly, what does strictly mean? Firm. Firm. Strictly guard the association of young men and young women during the school term. How, how does that, how, how, how would a school do that? How do you think a school would, would, would um, strictly guard the association of young men and young women? How, association means that they're not, yeah, that's it brother. So how do you do that? Because, because the schools, we, 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 our schools, the blueprints was not only all females, all males. That was not the blueprint. But how would you, how would, how would you, now there's nothing wrong obviously to be together, but I'm saying how would, how would one protect this? That they're not too much together. Some principles, some principles. I want you to see this principle. It says, listen to this. It is only when these rules are temporarily suspended. So question, were these rules always there or was there a time where the prophet says they were to be suspended? They were suspended. They were suspended at times. What rules are these? It is only when these rules are temporarily suspended as is sometimes the case that gentlemen are permitted to accompany ladies to and fro, to and from public gatherings. What was happening in our schools? Based on this quotation. They were allowed to allow access to public gatherings. Sorry, sister? They were in the company of each other too often. Okay, I think let's reread it. Okay, okay, amen. Okay, brother, you have your hand. No, 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 okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's reread it, okay, we're not getting it. Let's reread it. Watch the quotation. It's good, it's fine, let's reread it. It is only when these rules are temporarily suspended, as is sometimes the case, that gentlemen are permitted to accompany ladies to and fro, to and from public gatherings. So when, when they were doing public gatherings, the gentlemen were permitted to go with the ladies. Amen. So during the school time, they were not to accompany the ladies. But when the rules were suspended at some time they were, then they would accompany the ladies. Yes. It says our own college at Battle Creek, now listen to what she says. Our own college at Battle Creek has similar regulations, though not so stringent. Now, listen, let's, let's read it before I say that. Such rules are indispensable to, why has God given these rules? Such rules are indispensable to guard the youth from the danger of premature courtship and unwise marriage. So what happens if they're constantly in the same company? It can lead to unwise marriages. When they're constantly, and heaven doesn't want that. Do you know what happens when you're constantly with someone? What, what, what that does? It creates sympathy. And sympathy creates a bond. Yep, <laughs> you become attached. And even though it might be, now question, is it, do brothers get attached? I'm saying brothers, if they're constantly working together, doing God's work, do they become attached? But they become attached and they know. <laughs> There's no even thought that crosses their mind about becoming any closer than being friends. <laughs> but with a male and a female, there's a danger. There's a danger. If they are not consecrated, now even if they are consecrated, but too much in the same company is no good. Obviously, now someone says, then how do I get married? Now that, 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 that's what will come to someone's mind. Then, okay, then you say, I must be, then how? <laughs> There's some brethren that are married. Do you want to tell them how? I'm good tell about But you don't, that's not your calculation. You know whose calculation that is? That's God's calculation. It's not your calculation. Like country living, it's not your calculation. Where do I get the money? That's God's calculation. She says, another quotation on this point. Why at school? Do you know at school that the blueprint says there was no courtship permitted in school? Whenever the students came to worship, um, uh, to study, inspiration says that if they caught in, caught off the school. 
when a school is completely closed. This is the blueprint. And you know, amongst young people, there's a danger. Whether it's camp meetings, whatever the case, many young people, even so-called very zealous young people, they're always looking to see who's a present truth sister here for me. And that is not, that's, that's, if that is a purpose of a young man going to a present truth school or a camp meeting, he's going to leave that camp meeting destitute. And the blessing heaven desire to give him will not receive it. When he goes there, his mind should be on one thing. I want to get to know more of Jesus. That should consume his mind. Now listen to what the prophet says concerning the blueprint. She says, it is no use to spend time and money in the education of workers who will fall in love before they complete this education. She says it's a waste of time getting people to come to receive a true education and then when they come there, they're going to fall in love with someone. She says they have wasted their time. It continues, it says, and who cannot resist the first temptation in the form of an invitation to marriage? Inspiration is saying that at school, that shouldn't be in the minds of any. A young man looking to see which young lady. Mm -mm. You will not receive the blessing heaven wants to give. You will actually be robbed of the blessing. It says, in most cases, labor spent on such persons is wholly lost. When they enter the marriage relation, their usefulness in the work of God is at an end. They increase their family, they are dwarfed, crippled in every way, and cannot use the knowledge they have obtained. Now friends, in the final battle, those who God uses on his final team are those that are willing to give up everything and anything for Jesus. Everything and anything. Whatever God says, give up, they're willing to give up. Young people, whatever God calls us to sacrifice, if there's something we cherish too much, then heaven cannot choose us in that final team. Everything must be willing to put upon the altar of sacrifice. Everything. Everything. Now, come in your Bible to Genesis. Genesis. Want us to see something in Genesis. Genesis chapter 28. Did I say Genesis 28? Yes, Genesis 28. Genesis chapter 28. Are we there? Now, before I tell you the verse and before we read it, what should every home be? A little what? A little heaven on earth. This is every home should be. And in order for the home to be a heaven, who do you think has to be there? Jesus. Jesus. Can, do you know that a heaven without Jesus is not heaven? It's not heaven. Read the definition of heaven. The prophet actually gives a definition in the Bible commentary. She asks us, what is the definition of heaven? And she says, where Christ is, that's a heaven. Wherever Christ is, that place becomes a heaven. Now I want you to see that if God is going to be in your home, if God is going to be in your house, what does the Bible teach when God is in a place? Yes, the Bible, we're going to read something, Jacob's going to speak about God. He's going to say something about God. And he's going, to inter- he's going to introduce us to something. He's going to tell us something. Let's see what he says. Genesis chapter 28. This is after Jacob sees the vision. Tell me when God is in a place, what does that place become? It's Amen, sister. But it comes, uh, let's see what it says in verse 16. 28 verse 16. It says, And Jacob awakened out of sleep, And he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. So God is in a place. Now you want God where? In your home. That's that's how a home is going to become a heaven. Actually, in Adventist home, she says it's not diplomacy. 
It's not all these wonderful things. She says, mm -mm, governments, she says all these things have a place. You effort, she says it all has its place. But she says, what is the real thing is coming close to Jesus. Husband and wife drawing closer to Jesus. Let's see what it says here. Verse 17. It says, and he, Jacob, was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Can you see that if God's going to be in your home, your home now becomes a gate to heaven. When people enter into your home, they're getting a foretaste of what the true heaven looks like. They're getting an experience of what heaven truly is going to be like. Some people, they, 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 you, you know what they must be able to say when their time is up, they, they, wanna, they must tell you, I don't want to leave. They must tell you, I, the experience I received, yeah, I don't want to leave. Then you have evidence that your home is becoming a little heaven or not. We're not saying your home must be perfect, but we're saying that you should take the principles God has given and to your best of your ability, by God's strength, by his power, try and implement them. Our home should be a gate to heaven. Now, look at this quotation concerning what the prophet says on this issue of heaven. Mm. Oh, friends, you can write this down. I'm not reading it. Heavenly places. I should have read it before I showed you Exodus, the, the sanctuary. But this is a powerful quotation that goes with the sanctuary, God's dwelling place, and our homes. Heavenly Places, page 99. She says that our home should be a blessed sanctuary where God can come in. And that, that's what we looked at previously. You can write that down. I'm not going to read it. Now, I want you to see this. This is volume 7, 131. She says, heaven, where, where does heaven begin? On, earth. On, a, on this earth. This is where heaven ought to begin. On this earth. That's it, sister. The home. You know what she says in the book, this wonderful book, Adventist Home, 354. She says it's not the religion of the pulpit. Not the religion of the pulpit. As the religion of the family that reveals true character. It's not how much a man knows, how much a man teaches. We might study the whole book, Adventist Home, and be able to quote it. But if that man is not implementing those truths, it means nothing. Knowledge, if it's merely intellectual and it doesn't move from intellectual into the heart then it's useless. A man can have a theory about the atomic bomb. Do you know that, that, that previously, who was this man that, that, that put it together? I forget his name. What is his name? No, no, not that one. Um, Einstein. Do you know before, I believe it was um, Hitler, they had the theory of the atomic bomb. They had the theory. But they were struggling to put it into, like literally put this thing together. But Albert Einstein took that which was theory and he made it into something which was practical. And the war ended very soon after that. They used that once it was made, they used it once this place. They, 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 that is it. That is, and the, the World War, boom, it ended. It ended. Because a man took something which was theory and he put it into practice. When will this work be finished? When we take the theory that we have and we put it into practice, this world is going to be affected and this war will end. This war will end. Now, what was I saying? I was saying something. Okay, let's read this. No, after that. Okay, let's read. It says, heaven is to begin, begin on this earth. There was a thought. It says, red words, it says, they will make a, a heaven below they will make a heaven below in which to prepare for heaven above. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to enter the heaven above, what do I have to, based on this quotation, see sometimes we think heaven, 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 and yes, we want to get to heaven. But you will never, actually when you read inspiration, if God has to allow people into heaven, it will be misery for them. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's what the prophet says, it will be misery, it will be torture for them. To be in an atmosphere of heaven. So before we can actually enter into the heaven above, God must give us a foretaste of heaven here below. He must do this. Now, I just forget this thought. I forget this thought. Heavenly places 99. This has an indication whether 
we are, mm, we are getting a foretaste of heaven. This is an indication if we, if we are getting a foretaste of heaven. Thank you, Father, for your hand. Satan is truly afraid of what we are studying, Lord. Thank you so much for allowing the power to come back on. Please bless us as we continue to study. Please, Lord, may you prick at our hearts. May you draw us closer to you. And whatever idols need to be given up, please help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Mr. Lon. I'm reading Heavenly Places, um, page 99. Heavenly Places, page 99. Listen to what the prophet says. She says, now remember the question we are asking is how do we know that our homes are becoming a little heaven on earth? Or how do we know that, now remember, what makes a place heaven? You, you know this. What makes a place heaven? People just, all of a sudden, it's heaven. It's Jesus' presence that makes it a heaven. Jesus abiding in that home. Now we want to see, but based on this quotation, thank you, Lord. We want to see, based on this quotation, how do we know if Jesus is in the home? Watch this. Or in the heart, in the family, if that home is becoming a gate to heaven. It says here, if you... Now, by the way, what, what is she referring to? What spoken in our... She's context is homes. Context is homes. If you are abiding in Christ and Christ in you, you cannot speak an angry word. The prophet says if Christ is in that home, if that home is becoming a gate to heaven, a little heaven on earth, she says it's impossible for you to speak an angry word. It cannot be done. Someone says, but, 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 question, I wonder in heaven how many angry words are heard? None, brother. So if I'm going to, in order for God to prepare me there, he needs to prepare me here. In order if I'm going to live there, I must first have the life of heaven on this earth. Now this is a high, this is a, this is a high calling. Yeah, you need a mic. If you, give the brother the mic. Yes, I wanted to ask. Yes. It says you cannot speak angry words. Yes. So let's say I'm asking, even with our hearts, the Bible says what a man thinketh, so is he. Mm. They say I'm angry within, but I don't show it. I don't utter those words. Ah. So does this quote fit or? Okay. I, I think it's in Adventist home where she says she's talking counseling to her husband and wife. Mm. And the counsel was that she says you should press together, you should seek for unity. And she says that when you feel that the person is, you, you feel that you, you, like you're about to, she says, then cry aloud to God. Yeah. Don't allow it, as you can feel, she says immediately cry aloud to God. She says even if you cry aloud, meaning that you're part, the person in the family, the year you cry to God, she says do it. Yes. So what she is saying is that if you can feel it, yeah, immediately cry out to God. Yeah. Cry out to God for the help. Carry to God for the help. Now, mm, are we understanding, friends? Amen. If we want a little heaven on earth. Now, come with me in your Bible to Judges, Judges chapter 13. We're going to just transition quickly. Judges chapter 13. We, we can't spend time, we have to stop now, just now. Judges chapter 13. Yes. May I say one thing? Yes, yes. Yeah. Can you... What we were just talking about, yes. about when, you, when you're hearing it in your heart, um, the, I don't know if it's someone you're referring to, but there's a quote in Adventist Home, it's page 214. Mm. And I shared it with a couple of brethren. Um, but it doesn't have to be just for a husband. It can be for anyone. Mm. And it says, it says, Help me, O God, to resist temptation, yeah. mm. to put all bitterness yes. and wrath and evil speaking out of my heart. Mm. Give me thy meekness, thy lowliness, 
thy long suffering and thy love. Mm. Lead me not to dishonor my Redeemer, mm. to misinterpret the words and motives of my wife, or your brother or sister, mm. of my wife, of my children, of my, and my brethren and sisters of the faith. Mm. Help me that I may be kind, pitiful, tender-hearted, forgiving. Mm. Help me to be a real house band mm. and to represent the character of Christ to others. Mm. Amen. She gives that as a quote for a prayer. Amen. But it, I, I, that can be for anyone. Amen. Amen. That, that, amen, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Uh, page 214. Judges 13. Judges 13. Judges 13. Now, what we want to do is, we want to transition. I'm coming back to the young people. So we, 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 we spoke about the home. I want us to just touch very briefly on the issue of children. Very, very briefly. I'm coming back to the young people. So God desires that every home, every home, should be a little heaven on earth. And if your home was really a little heaven on earth, it should be a what? What would it be? A gate to the real heaven. Now, I want us to look at this issue in Judges chapter 13. Before this woman, Manoah's wife, could give birth to this child, she was bearing a child. Do you know that God sent an angel to instruct her concerning the child she was to bear? That means then I'm saying, if, the, if, if what we are reading, we're going to read it now. That means then God requires a parent to have knowledge concerning what he's going to speak about. Maybe it's not so directly, but the laws that he's introducing, he's introducing some sort of laws to this woman concerning a child she's, she's, about to, she's about to obviously give birth to. She's going to conceive and then give birth to. I want you to see, and I believe that should, not only what I believe, but we're going to read the quotation, that if parents fail to understand these, what, what we're about to read, these principles, inspiration says they commit a great son. A great son. Before a home, actually, let me ask you this. Before a man starts building a, 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 a house, let's say he's building a house, he's been hired to build a house. Question, you hired, let's say you hired a man. And that man just comes and he starts laying, he puts the foundation, he starts laying bricks, he starts building. Will you accept that building? When he don't show you, he just comes there. He don't show you no, no, nothing he shows you. He just says, I'm going to do the work. You will see it when the end product comes. Will you just accept that? No. <laughs> you say, brother, please show me. Give me something in writing. Before a man builds a home, okay, I told you there's redemption. If you don't know, fine. God later can redeem and show you. But for those who build him, you must build according to the pattern. If there's going to be a child, guess what book you have to read before the child is born? Child guidance. Adventist home, these books have to be read. God never wastes time when he instructed the prophet and gave those hundreds of pages. There was a reason for it. Now let's read here Judges chapter 13. Judges 13. Um, Judges chapter 13, verse 3 and verse 4. It says, now this is Manoah's wife. It says, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, thou art barren, and thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now tell me, let's read verse 4. It says, Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. Friends, I'm asking a question. What was the woman instructed concerning what laws? Health laws. health laws. So before the child was born, that God gives special instruction concerning health laws. So before, a, in, now do you think that the Bible was just written for Manoah and his, that this was just for, for him and his wife? No, it's not. It's for our admonition. So before a wife can conceive and a husband and wife come together and she's going to conceive, what do you think heaven will require them to understand before they can conceive their child? 
Oh, amen. Basically, I'll break it up into two things. The prophet's going to give us nine things. But I'm going to break it up into two things, anatomy and physiology. Basically, some, someone says, what is anatomy and physiology? Anatomy is the study of the structure of the human body. It's the structure, what, where, is what organ, where does well. That's the structure of the body. That's an, that's physiology is what each part does. The function of each part. Every parent should study that before the child is born. They should be educated concerning anatomy and physiology. Let's see what the prophet says. From child guidance. This is from child guidance. Listen to what she says. She says, parents should study the laws of nature. That's the health laws. They should become acquainted with the organism of the human body. She continues, she says, they need to understand the function. What, what? <laughs> it says they need to understand the functions of the various organs and their relation and dependence. They should study the relation of the mental to the, to the physical powers and the conditions required for the healthy action of each. Then she says, to assume the responsibility of parenthood without such preparation is a sin. People just think, oh, I want a child. Oh, it's so nice to have children. But you'll be, you be committing a sin. Fail to understand these things. And we showed you Bible shows that God in his mind, before a child can be, con be born, those parents need to become intelligent in regarding to the, the natural law. Again, she says, upon fathers as well as mothers rest a responsibility for the child's early as well as its later training. And for both par parents, the demand for careful and thorough preparation is most urgent. Before taking upon themselves the possibilities of fatherhood and motherhood, men and women should become acquainted with the laws of physical development, with physiology and hygiene with the bearing of prenatal influences. Now, what, is, what, what does she mean, prenatal influences? What is that? Before birth. Do you know that there's entire counsel in a book, Mind, Character, and Personality, entire instruction, deep instruction on prenatal, when a woman is in that stage. Now, someone says, oh, that's just for the wife, but do you know that she says that even the way the husband treats the wife during that period affects the child within the womb. Within the home. And you'll actually see that even during a pregnancy, it says husbands, no, no one's pregnant here, but during that, that period, much of the cares and the duties of the home, she must be released from. She must be released. That's inspiration. God. But once the child comes in, obviously she picks up her duties again. It says, third, so one, phys uh, physiology and hygiene, with the bearing of prenatal influences, with the laws of hereditary, sanitation, dress, exercise, the treatment of disease. So what should they become? Medical missionary. Medical missionary. They should also understand the laws of mental development and moral training. Never will education, this is a quotation we read in our previous studies, never will education accomplish all that it might and should accomplish until the importance of parents as workers fully recognize and they receive a training for its sacred responsibilities. So what book would train a parent to be a parent? Child guidance, child guidance, child guidance, child guidance. So before children can be conceived, this is what inspiration says. Now in these last days, the prophet says it's not wise. It's not wise. She says, it is not written now in these last days. Now obviously she says it's not wise. Now we don't make a rule for everyone. We read the quotation and leave it with everyone. It says it's really not wise to have children now. Time, why? Why did she say that? Time is short and the parents of the last days are upon us and little children will, will be largely swept off before this. So, inspiration. Now, did she say that no one is to have? She says it's not wise. So, it's not saying that quotation is not saying that no one should have children. And that if someone has a child, they're committing sin. But it's not wise. I remember once we received a, a message, and I think the person had three children. They said, I would just like to have one more. 
would that be a sin against God, knowing that we got such a short, short period of time? Got three children. <laughs> Why do you want to afford the one? <laughs> Probation is about to close. <laughs> it don't make sense. Don't make sense. Now, I want to, I want, uh, there's more, but our time is up for next session. I want to close. Come with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. Let's read Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. Matthew 24, verse 3. Now Jesus was asking Matthew 24, verse 3, the signs that were to precede the end. It says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they're asking for events that will precede his coming. So I want us to look at these events. Let's look at these events. Jesus says in verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famine, pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. Verse 8, All these are not the end. They're the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of the end. And then verse 9, he says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. What event is verse 9? Not can't be National Sunday Law. That can't be it. No, it's, it's when they can deliver us up to kill you. Yes, you, it is, it's, there's persecution here, but it's, some, it's not that National Sunday Law. It's the Universal Sunday Law. It says, how someone says, why do you say that? It says, look, look at verse 9. It says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated by all, all nations for my name's sake. So it's all nations are going to hate us. It's not, just, it's not just one nation enforcing the Sunday law. This is now universal persecution, universal Sunday law. But what leads up to it, what leads up to it is the things based on verse 7. Now it's interesting, Jesus says, that you're going to be hated for my name's sake. Now, the Bible tells us what's his name. His name shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So what will they hate us for? Our characters are in harmony with, with Christ. And Satan sees us as a threat, and he says, now we persecute and kill them. Since sin, we could not get them in sin. Let's kill them. But he's going to try. Obviously, some will die as martyrs. But God will reserve a, a special group of people that are going to go through the, the, the great time of trouble. Now, and you know, it's interesting, very interesting. The question was asked in Revelation 16, verse 17, who shall be able to stand? Do you know Proverbs chapter 12 tells us who, who, who is going to stand? Coming to Proverbs 12, I want you to see, I'm coming back to Matthew 24. I want you to see Proverbs chapter 12, who will stand? What is that? <laughs> well, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 7. Listen to which, which, who will stand. Proverbs 12, verse 7. It says, the wicked are overthrown and are not, but the house of the righteous shall stand. Who is going to stand? The house of the righteous. Those whose homes have actually... They, they, Yes, those homes, it's a little heaven on earth. Those homes are going to stand. Those homes are going to stand. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. And friends, we have an example, publicly speaking, of how the righteousness of a man within his home affected his entire family. And his entire family was saved. Do you know who? Noah. Noah. It says, by faith, Noah became an heir of righteousness, which is by faith. And it says that he moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Noah had an experience of righteousness by faith. And he done exactly what God said, and his family was saved. Do you know there was another man? There was another man that when God warned him, he did not move with fear. 
And because he did not move with fear, his entire family was lost. It was Lot. Entire family. Do you know inspiration says that had Lot moved immediately when the angel spoke, his wife would have never turned into a pillar of salt. It was his lingering spirit caused his wife to be lost. There's another man that because of his righteousness, his entire family was saved. Not that just his righteousness, but it affected him within the home. Abraham. Abraham. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. God says, I know him, that he would order his family after me. He says, I know him. And he actually says, his children. God says, his children. He will order them after me. God fully understood Abraham. That's why he entra- Do you know how many people it was in Abraham's household? It was over a thousand souls in his household. A man, imagine a thousand people. Some people can't handle three, four people. Can't do it. Abraham had a thousand. And if we had, we would look, there was things that Abraham done. When you study the Bible, you'd see one of Abraham's things, wherever he went, publicly speaking, he set up an altar. Wherever he went, he set up an altar. There was morning and evening worship within his home. Abraham's home, based on the Bible, was a school. It says that he had trained servants. His home became a school. In Abraham's home, the law was honored. Based on Genesis, it says that Abraham obeyed God's voice and he kept his law. Even though the law came later on, God spoke it, but Abraham fully understood the law. Now, I want us to read Matthew 24, we in verse 7. Now, tell me, what, what does Jesus say or some of the things? Before we look at that, we are talking about righteousness, right? Listen to this quotation before we read that. Mount of Blessings 128. She says, if Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Is that right? Is that an experience of righteousness by faith when Christ is in us? She says, if Christ is in you, the hope of glory, you will have no disposition to watch others to expose their errors. So if you, in in your family, you're not going to look at wife to expose their errors. And husband is not going to look at wife, uh, yeah, husband and wife, vice versa. You're not going to look at each other to expose each other's faults. You're not going to do that. Now, you know how you know that a young person is unprepared for marriage. Do you know, I'm saying, do you know how a young person is unprepared? Put that young person with a whole lot of other young people. And when that young people starts complaining about other young people, then you know that young person is unprepared for marriage. If they are looking at faults of all the young, and say, hey man, these, these, all these other men got so much problems. Do you know that that young man is unprepared? That young sister that can complain about other sisters, they are unprepared for marriage. Someone says, why? If you can't live a month with other people, how are you going to link your life destiny with one individual? What in, and that's just one month you're already saying, oh, so much problems. It'll take six months when that spell of love you think you have to be blown away. And then you'll realize you made the biggest mistake in your life. A young person is unfit for marriage. Unfit, unfit, unfit. If now, can't, complaining, this person, that, unfit. Unfit. Do you know when a husband sees a fault with wife, what husband should do? Husband should go to wife, you know what? Let's pray. Let us, let us pray, let us deal with the issue. And if brother sees problem with brother, what he should do? He should call brother aside and pray with brother. If sister sees, oh, I think this sister has a problem with me. You know what that sister should do? Shouldn't go and tell another, some, go with the sister, speak with the sister and pray with the sister. Amen. Friends, if we cannot live together a month and we expect to live with that person in heaven, you're deceiving yourself. Friends, God is, yeah, may God help us. It says, if Christ is in you, the hope of glory, you will have no disposition to watch others and expose their errors. Instead of seeking to accuse and condemn, 
it will be your object to help, to bless, and to save. Imagine if every household, when a husband sees wife erring, that he doesn't come and expose her to others, he tries to, what, what does she say? To help her, bless, and save. What, what a family that would be. When a wife sees husband, his spirituality is down. Do you know that there was time when Luther, the great reformer, was down? And his wife at times would encourage him. At once she came to him, she says, I think then God is dead. Luther was so depressed. She came, she says, I think God is dead. Do you know, she knew the man Luther was. Luther got up off his depression. The man picked up his Bible, he was back on the field. <laughs> she knew exactly how to get Luther. Luther, you challenge him. And she came, she says, I, I, I think God is dead then. The man, his depression departed. He knew God's not dead. <laughs> and he would show her God's not dead. So imagine every family when a wife sees her husband is airy. Now, you know you're not perfect. Husband, you know when you married your wife, she was not perfect. She's thriving. When you'll see problems, because the prophet says that you're going to see problems. When you'll see that you see it, you don't, in a loving way, prophet says, try to help, to bless, to save. And that's actually the duty of the husband. The Bible says that is his duty. Christ is yes, Christ is character. Again, she says, again, she says, where's this quotation? Mm, mm, mm. Let's read this, Mount of Blessings, page 16. She says, it is the love of self that destroys our peace. Do you know what normally happens in the home? When one's person's spirituality, they, they're making mistakes, they know between them and God they're making mistakes, you know what normally happens? They become frustrated. And then normally, it's the one closest to them, they take out their frustration. So they're making mistakes, and then they're looking now for, how would we do, how do we say this? Okay, not a yeah, not scapegoat, but because you are frustrated and making mistakes that, like, you, you express it in a negative way to the partner. And sometimes it's not that the, the man, the husband, is intentionally, he, he's, 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 he feels that I'm supposed to be gaining victory. Or the wife says, I'm supposed to be gaining victory, and she sees, and then she becomes frustrated, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not making, and then the husband just says something slight, and boom, explosion. Why, she says, we don't have peace is because the love of self that destroys our peace. Do you know when we love self, we're ever ready to protect self? And sometimes a sister might not even attention. I'm saying, now, I'm saying now to those who are not married, how do you know you prepared for marriage? You need to be able to love with people and not want to try and expose. Yeah, pray for them, speak with them. Now, she says, Sometimes, even in the family, why there's issues? Because self is alive. And the husband or wife might not mean it to other partner or brother or sister, but because self is alive, the slightest thing that is said, even at not even a, no, nothing intended, because self is alive, self stands ever ready to guard and protect itself. And why there's so much problems, whether man, woman, whatever, is because self is alive. And the slightest thing done, guess what happens? Self becomes wounded. This is what the prophet says. She says, while self is all alive, we stand ready continually to guard it from mortification and insults. Jesus never tried and guard himself from mortification and insults. Whatever they said and they, they done, Jesus, actually Jesus fully understood that nothing can touch him but that which infinite love permits for the blessing of humanity. And she says, nothing can befall us unless God permits it to befall us. She says, while self is all alive and we stand ready continually to guard it from mortification and insults, but when we are dead, our life is hid with Christ in God. We shall not take neglects or slights to heart. So if somebody neglects, slights us, you think, oh, they've just been funny, or whatever the case may be, if self is alive, you know what self is going to do? Self is going to take issue with that. Self is going to take issue. But if self is dead, you wouldn't, wouldn't bother you. Obviously, it would bother you in a sense that you'd want to find, you try and you want this person to be reconciled with God. 
Because you know maybe they have an issue with God, a rela- their relationship with God is a problem. What brings problems based on their quotation itself? Love of self. It's only when self is dead can there be true unity. As long as self is alive, there's going to be issues. Self must be laid upon the altar. And must. When self is put upon the altar, she says, we shall be deaf to reproach and blind to scorn and insults. This is Jesus' character. Let's, let's finish this. Let's read verse 7. So it says, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. So Jesus specifically mentions the very last thing in the list that he gives there is earthquakes. What is earthquakes? Climate change, natural disasters. So Jesus mentions that natural disaster is going to be the climate. I would say that the, uh, this is going to be the crisis that's going to drive us into that persecution. Obviously, which gives, but the, the persecution is the Sunday law. But climate change is going to be the crisis. That's Great Controversy 589, 590. Climate change, the natural disasters, become the reason for the call for Sunday. To restore temporal prosperity, she says, and also to avert those, those calamities. So climate change is going to be the issue. Now, I want you to see this on the issue of climate change. Jesus also mentions wars, rumors of wars. Now, it's, this year came out December 8, 2022. December 8, 2022. It says Pope Francis, the man of sin. Does the man, this man have anything to do with the winding up of this earth's history? Yes. Figures largely. It says, Pope Francis, the cry for our mistreated planet is inseparable from the cry of suffering humanity. What does that interpret? What, 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 how would you understand that? If you want to stop the cry of suffering humanity, what must we first help? The planet, that's what he's saying. He says that the cry of the mistreated planet is inseparable from the cry of suffering humanity. So if I want to help suffering humanity, is saying what you best do if I want to help humanity, let's save the planet. Yeah, this is, this, the Bible teaches that the, the planet, the earth, is waxing all like a garment. Now, November 26, 2022, what came out? It says BC Bank unveiled, this is in Canada, Carbon Footprint Tracking Credit Card. Couple of days back, Canada just introduced a credit card, Carbon, what is it? Carbon Footprint. Not Carbon Footprint, you use this credit card, and this credit card works with not your money, how much your carbon footprint, how much carbon have you used? When you overuse your limits, you can swipe and swipe nothing. Canada has just introduced this. Climate change, link to climate change. Yep. I want you to see, this here is Fox News. And the way they start is by tracking you. If you go deep in the weeds and what these people are saying at this place, they're openly scheming up some of the craziest plans you'll ever hear of like tracking your carbon footprint. We're developing through technology an ability for consumers to measure their own carbon footprint. What does that mean? That's where are they traveling? How are they traveling? What are they eating? What are they consuming on the platform? So individual carbon footprint tracker. Hmm. Stay tuned. So it tracks everything you do. How much, wherever, everything. And they under the guise, it's all for the climate. You think that they worry about the climate? They want to control you. They want to control you. Now, well, this is, by the way, it's World Economic Forum. Obviously, United States part of it. Now, I want you to hear that even Google, the World Economic Forum, they control Google. Listen to what, this is an interview concerning Google and climate change. You know, we partnered with Google, for example. If you Google climate change, you will, at the top of your search, you will get all kinds of UN resources. We 
started this partnership when we were shocked to see that when we Googled climate change, we were getting incredibly distorted uh, information right at the top. So we, we're becoming much more proactive. Um, you know, we own the science and we think that the world you know, should know it, and and the platforms themselves also do. Um, but again, it's it's it is um, it's it's a huge, huge challenge that I think. Did you hear what she says? No. We own the science, and the world should know it. That's what she said. The world should know it. So they control Google when you search for something. Based specific, now, it's the, she specifically mentioned climate. Do you think it's only climate change that when you search for it? Do you know that Google gives you a, a list of things? Then you have to go to number two, number three, number four, number five. They might put what you're really looking for, number eight, number 10. Yeah. And they put what they want you to get in the first hit that you, that you make. Yeah. We showed you South Africa. Now, I want you to listen to this. So the UK is currently the head of the G7 group. That's the world's most economically advanced countries. And the UK currently chairs the G7 group. Our chancellor, who does our economy... Called so you mentioned the G7 group. Which, which, which nation leads the G7 group? The Julia? Uh, it's the UK, right? Yes. Now, who's the, do you know who's the president today? I'm not the, the prime minister. Sunak. Sunak. Now, listen to what he says. Now, the G7, the most advanced economical nations. And who was at the head of that, of the G7? UK. And who was at the head of UK? What does Sunak want? We showed you what he wants. Digital currency. There's a great star as we are coming to 2023 for a digital currency. Great star. Chancellor of the Exchequer. His name's Rishi Sunak. He's put out this video. This is all on my feeds, by the way, my social feeds. He put out this video saying that um, what they want to do is bring in this uh, thing called the central banking digital currency. They want to replace fiat paper money with digital money as a competitor to Bitcoin and crypto money, right? But instead of being a decentralized currency, it will be controlled by a government. It's digital currency, but controlled centrally through the banks, Bank of England. So instead of having a bank account with whatever, HSBC or Bank of America, you'll have a bank account directly with, in the American context, with the Fed. In the UK, directly with the Bank of England. You have a personal bank account and you're given digital money in that bank account. These are called central banking digital currencies. The Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK has already announced their intention to do this as the G7 group. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. Did you actually say, friends, full, control, full understanding control of every, every transaction you make? Full control. Do you know that what God is allowing us to see is the animals walking into the ark, so to speak? We are literally seeing it, friends. And woe to us if we look at these things as entertainment. We see these things and say, wow, I see what's happening. And that's it. Do you know what, when we see such movements to control, to control the buying and selling, God specifically says that when we see that, when we see a movement, it's actually the prophet says, again and again. What do you think the Lord has told us again and again? Get out of the cities into the country where you can raise your own provision for in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. Country Living, page nine. When we see these movements, friends, we don't have much time. We don't have much time left. Since in my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Now, in all our analysis on CBDC in particular... Do you know who's this man? He is speaking on behalf of the Bank for International Set Settlements. This was a meeting with the IMF, Bank of International Settlements, they were speaking. And this is what he said when he, he was speaking, this is what he had to say at this meeting. 
particular for the use of general to the general use, uh, we tend to establish the equivalence with cash. Uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, for example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who's using a $100 bill today. We don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. Uh, the, a key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also, we will have the technology to enforce that. Did you hear what he said? We'll have full control. Full control. Is that, is that what the Bible says is going to happen? Exactly what Revelation 13 says is going to happen, verse 17. Now, I want to look at a few more things and we're going to conclude. We want to look at a few more things and then conclude. Klaus Schwab call, talking about a new world order. Recently, he just called for it. 14 November 2022. We'll skip that. We'll skip that. We want to close. We want to close. Russia, China, are those nations have anything to do with end time events? We're going to study, we look at it, Daniel 11, looking at the king of the south. Russia and China to abandon the dollar in the energy trade. So they said they're abandoning the dollar, no more using. Do you know that what currency um, is used specifically, obviously buying petrol and, and gas and so forth, do you know what currency is used to purchase these things? It's the dollar. It's under the, 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 when they first introduced it, they called it the petrol dollar. But Russia and China said, we're doing away with that. We're no more using the dollar. Then it says, now obviously they have, Russia and China looks at America as their enemies, that's Bible. It says US, this year was Iran. This is uh, 3rd of November 2022, US is not invincible. The Iranian leader spoke to a group of students and he was speaking to them. It says that nation is not invincible. And he called their mind to an event that took place in 1979. Interesting, we're not going there. 1979, there was an event that took place. North Korea warns US of powerful response to ally drills. What happened is South Korea and America were actually doing drills near North Korea and that, I forget his name, but they like shoot, shooting rockets. Something like that. So. When he saw that, he started firing rockets. And he says that if America keeps doing this, there's his words, there's going to be a powerful response. Powerful response. Russia's victory, this is the, do you know who's this man? Yes, NATO. This is the NATO leader, St uh, Stolenberg. Russia's victory will be NATO's defeat. What are they telling you indirectly? That NATO is involved with the war in Ukraine. And should Russia win, they said it would be their defeat, NATO's defeat. Now, do you know that in the, in the battle between Ukraine and Russia, that a missile was shot and killed two people in Poland? And immediately Zelensky came on television, and he says now Zelensky is the president of Ukraine. Now, before, you, before I even go further, do you know who but Poland, uh, Poland is, who they linked with? They are member, they are NATO member. Do you know the article, I think it's article five or four, that says that an attack against one is an attack against all. And immediately it calls for every nation that's a part of NATO to come and fight whichever nation it is that they see as the threat. Do you know immediately when it went, Zelensky came on, t on television and he says that NATO article so-and-so needs to be put into place that Russia now has crossed the line. Do you know what every NATO nation said, even this Stolenberg, every, they came out, they said, no, 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 it's not Russia. <laughs> they all came out, Biden was questioned as he was walking. Biden said, he said, before he even had the facts, he says, I'm sure it's not Russia. You know why? They don't want to fight directly. It's better for a nation, this is, this is how they've always done in America, that it's proxy war. You give the money, let them fight on another man's soil and kill, let them kill each other, but not on our soil. So even when they, Russia shot, not Russia. 
They didn't want Article 5 to be put into position because they don't want a direct conflict with Russia. But the Bible does teach Russia is going to collapse, China is going to collapse, and America will enforce a Sunday law. Now, Russia sees Germany. Germany, by the way, is a part of NATO. You'll know that. Now, what has happened is Russia had closed the gas that is flowing into Germany, specifically Germany. He has shut it off. It says here, yeah, German faces scrutiny. Now, when he done that, it caused, it caused um, a, 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 a spike in the price. Because why? Russia has cut it off. It says, so the, the chancellor had to do something. It says Germany faces scrutiny from the EU peers over massive 200 billion aids um, scheme to cushion high gas bills. So what did he do? He had to pump 2 billion into the economy to help Germany with the crisis they are facing. Tensions flare over the EU's new, EU's new irresponsible big spender. So Germany belongs to the European Union and they were agitated and upset because of what he's doing. It actually affects the entire European nations, all of them. When one nation pumps 200 billion into their economy, what happens is then it affects other places in Europe because now it places them on a, on a, better, a better scale, so to speak, than other nations. It makes things more difficult for other nations. Again, Germany is spending 200 billion to fight Putin's energy squeeze. Will it end up dividing Europe because it's actually causing tension? Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz has unveiled a 200 billion euro plan to guard the German economy against the effects of soaring energy prices. Critics argue Berlin is using its economic power to bail out its own businesses, regardless of other member states that lack the fiscal firepower to do the same. Germany is coping with an energy crisis after Russia cut gas supplies to Berlin. First, Russia has shut off natural gas flows to Germany. Now. Russia has suspended all gas supplies to Germany through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. Tens of thousands of protesters in Germany took to the streets in response to the energy crisis and a new government package that many call an unfair distribution of funds. Question, is this war only between Russia and Ukraine? <laughs> no, we can see that Germany has been impacted. Not just Germany, all of Europe has been impacted because they're all dependent upon Russian gas. All dependent. Now, on a close, who is the man that is coming to the rescue here? Who is the man that is coming to the rescue? King of the North? It seems like he's coming as a man of peace. It says Russian envoy hails Pope's mediation role. So who is stepping in as the one to mediate between this crisis? This year was 8th of November, 2022, the man of sin. Bible says this is exactly what he would do. Daniel chapter 8. He will destroy many by peace. I want to conclude on this point. We are told in the book Medical Ministry, page 49, that Christ was a seventh day Adventist to all intents and purposes. What was Christ? Seventh a seventh day Adventist. Prophet says he was a seventh day Adventist. Do you know that Jesus, now let me ask you this what did Jesus spend more time doing? She says in ministry of healing, he spent more time doing what? Healing than, than teaching. That's what the prophet says. But do you know there's something he spent more time combined with healing and teaching combined, he spent more time in? How, amen? He's more, actually, <laughs> I'm going to say yes, he prayed, but I'm saying true, he, he spent a lot of time in prayer. But he spent 30 years in his home and only three and a half years healing and teaching. And what was Christ? A Seventh-day Adventist. Where, what was more, what, what, as an example, what did he show us is more important? The home. 30 years inside the home and only three and a half years in ministry. That shows in the mind of God, no ministry can be truly successful unless the home is set in order. She says in the book Ministry of Healing that the restoration 
and uplifting of humanity doesn't begin in the church, it begins in the home. It begins in the home. Friends, if we're going to pass this crisis, if we're going to pass this crisis, this must be set in order. Must first. We're on the verge of this crisis. 2023, thinking men are saying, we see a collapse, financial collapse, and we see a digital economy. What does that indicate when we see that our earthly support is about to be cut off? What does that indicate? Yes, Sunday law, but remember, the church is almost perfected. Why? She says it never can an all-round Christian character be perfected until every earthly support is cut off. That means God sees that the church is almost ready. Therefore, God says, let them now start setting it on, into operation that which is going to cut off every earthly support. We're almost there. We're almost there. Jesus says that these things have I said unto you, that my joy might re remain. Yes. And that your joy might be full. Why does God tell us things? That we might have what? Joy. joy. And what kind of joy? Full. Says that your joy might be full. Fullness of joy. Whatever he says, whether it's the Adventist home, whether it's how to grow up children, the purpose is he only gives us these instructions so that we might have joy. Amen. That's the only reason he wants us to have joy. Amen. Let's reverently kneel. Let's pray. Loving Father, we want to thank you for this brief study. Thank you so much for what you have revealed to us. And Father, we know that all your burdens are enablings. If you are commanded, if you have given instruction that every home should be a little heaven on earth, that means behind that command, there's your power to help every home develop such a such a a, a, a place that every home can be a little heaven on earth. Father, we just plead for mothers, fathers, children. We plead, Lord, that everyone would take this serious. A crisis is brewing. This is not a game. This is not entertainment. This is a reality. A storm is brewing. And I just pray, Lord, where parents have neglected their duties, whether their children are one or whatever their age might be, may they take up their neglected work. I pray that you'd give wisdom to those who want to do as you have instructed. You said, Lord, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask. Please, may you give wisdom to those who are parents that have children and they are seeking to do and please you, Lord. Please, may you give them wisdom. And we know that your wisdom is found in the books you have given us. Mm -hmm. Father, I just pray as well for the young people. Those who have not yet taken the step in marriage, we know that Satan, one of his most successful means to bring misery and hopeless woe to the human family, we are told is by uniting those who are wholly unsuited to each other. He exalts in this work, we are told. Please, Lord, give strength. And I truly believe the only way a young person can be kept from such is when they love someone greater. When they are so in love with Jesus, we know that all Satan's temptations would fail. They need a love that is stronger than the love of, yeah, of earthly love. Please, Lord, I just plead, may your love just be a shield around every young person. And then if ever they do take the step, may they do it, knowing that indeed this is what heaven has called me to do. Father, please bless us, prepare us for what is about to come. We know that very soon all earthly support will be cut off. And you have given us instruction that while we have peace, now is the time we are to leave the city, go into the country, and raise our own provision. 
the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious crisis, and that crisis is very imminent. Mm -hmm. Please, may you help us all, Lord. Bless those. We know, Lord, that we don't need to calculate the funds. That's your doings. All heaven requires that we have faith. Mm -hmm. Please help your children. Thank you so much, Lord, once again. We love you. Please keep our hearts and our minds. Lord, we cannot keep our hearts. Your oxen that you would take it and keep it. Keep it pure, Lord. We love you and we commit ourselves to you. We reconsecrate our lives to thee. Please take our hearts forward and let it be consecrated to thee. Bless us now and abide with us even as we go into our next session. We ask your blessing. May your spirit be with us. We are told that a crisis is coming and we must become intelligent in regard to disease, cause, prevention, and cure. Please bless us and draw us ever closer to you, for we ask these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But all the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the King, and I shall see Him face to face.